behind me is Medicine Buddha. I know there are a few new people here today. And let me just make a few announcements. I am not Robert Thurman. <laughs> and for those of you who are expecting him, the general schedule we have is that uh, I, Dale Borglum, am here in the morning. He is here from 4 to 6 in the afternoon. And we together are here in the evening for the evening session. Tomorrow morning, since it's the final session, Bob and I will both be here doing the concluding session. If you have come late and you haven't signed up on the Living Dying Pro Project mailing list and you would like to do that, uh, I have that piece of paper up here. You're more than welcome to get on the Living Dying Project mailing list. For those of you who have come late and missed uh, the introductory material that I have been presenting, I have promised both Ava and Susan and anyone else who would like, you can join me at lunch and I will give some sort of summary of what has preceded what we will be doing today. I would also like to encourage people to be interactive and collaborative here. Uh, I can talk for hours, even days, as Bob also can, I'm sure, as you have noticed. But I am much more uh, amenable to an interactive kind of a situation than a lecture one. So please feel free to jump in at any time. Today is Halloween, trick or treat. And hopefully there will be some treats here this morning. Today is the one year anniversary of my brother dying. And in fact, since it's, well, I guess it's not quite exactly the hour since it's, he died in California. But I would like to dedicate my uh, talk here today to the memory of my brother David, who was a Christian minister, my younger brother, uh, a much kinder and more loving person than I. Although he was really not made for this world. He really was a, uh, almost like a, a, a Davy or a being from the heaven realms. He didn't really quite know how to make his way in the world. But he touched many, many people with his heart. So uh, wherever you are, David, onward, onward into the light. Uh, I'd also like to, since this is my last time being here alone without Bob at my side, I'd like to just briefly mention a few things about the Living Dying Project. I run an organization in California. Most of you have gotten a brochure. If you haven't, there is much more information than, than is on the brochure at my website, livingdying.org, uh, a website that we are trying to make the go-to website for anyone interested in conscious dying. There are many uh, audio files of talks and meditations that I have done, as well as text files of meditations by Stephen Levine, myself, Joan Halifax, and a number of other people. So there's a lot of great information there. Uh, if you would like to get your friends on the mailing list, there's a place there to join the mailing list. Uh, a couple of other points uh, about Six months ago or so, I got a, uh, an email from a woman who said that she had been Googling the name of a friend of hers who was her boyfriend in high school. They had both gone to high school together in, I believe it was Queens, New York. And they were best of friends, and they had gone their separate ways. And she had just started thinking about him after some decades. and. And in Googling him, found out that, that he had died because there was an article in the Living Dying Project newsletter about how one of our volunteers had cared for her friend, Eric. No, it wasn't Eric. That was another fellow. But anyway, I, f I even forget his name. But he had died of AIDS maybe 10 or 12 years ago. And she wanted to know if we had any more photographs of him which we did, and I sent her a whole stack of photographs of this very beautiful guy. And she said, I'd like to help you. I'm a network marketer. It's a way of earning funds and, and 
letting your organization go forward without spending a, a dime. So I had to promise to do network marketing, which means that with, whenever I'm in a room full of people, I'm supposed to say, here's what we do, here's what I do, and if you know anybody, or if you are somebody who would like me to come and do this for another group, let me know. And if you know any way that the Living Dying Project can earn some money or get some grants or donations, you could also let me know. Half an hour before the workshop started on uh, Thursday, I got an email from a uh, granting foundation, a grant that we were assured we would get, which would have covered two-thirds of our operating budget for the next year, saying, oh, no, we're not going to give you any money. So all of a sudden, I'm back in the, in the fundraising business. So if anybody has any great suggestions about that, that would be greatly appreciated. So that's the Living Dying Project. And as I mentioned before, having some combination of an inner contemplative practice combined with an intimate relationship with death, in my humble opinion, is the best, most powerful way to freedom here in this strange time in which we live. So I, I live in Northern California near San Francisco. Uh, probably not too many of you people are from California. Most of you are from around here. And there might not be anything quite like the Living Dying Project. But even if there is not, you can become a volunteer at a hospice. You can find some organization where you can work with dying people and you're not even saying, I'm going to do the spiritual thing. You're just there as a regular volunteer, and you're doing the spiritual part of it as a uh, sort of a uh, covert operation, if you will. And maybe even ask the person who's choosing who you get to work with to find the people that need the most spiritual care. So, so far, we have been talking in this in these meetings, uh, Bob and I have almost non-intersecting bodies of information and wisdom, it turns out, which is really a great balance. I, I'm, I'm so honored and happy to be with him and here at Menlo. Uh, I am more from the practical standpoint of what do you do at a bedside, how do you deal with your own suffering, and uh, I have studied Tibetan Buddhism quite extensively, but certainly nowhere to the depth that uh, Robert Thurman has. So I have been finding, and I will just repeat very briefly what most of you have heard, but there are uh, about half a dozen new people in the room here today. I have been finding that many meditators uh, have not really created a foundation for being able to let go of identification with personality structure and character structure and begin to identify with nature of mind. Now, nature of mind, Buddha nature, Christ consciousness, whatever you want to call that, is very important in the context of our workshop here because when we die, as the conversation last night suggested, we die into Buddha nature, we die into our true nature. So that when we're talking about supporting the dying, if we are talking about that in the deepest sense, it becomes a spiritual process. Yes, there is a medical process, yes, there is a psychological process, but uh, eventually dying is a spiritual process where we die into who we are all along. Now, all the world's religions say that right now in this room, you and I are enlightened. We are filled with that light. That is our nature. And whether we're having a good day or a bad day, whether we're feeling particularly grumpy or particularly happy today, no matter what the content is, underneath the content, or actually more accurately permeating the content, is what could be called luminosity or presence the body of Christ. And because, though, we are socialized and conditioned and living in what seems to be solid bodies, although physics and biology would tell you that our bodies are very, very far from solid, 
that we're actually 99.9% .9 space, even though this does seem pretty solid, uh, because we're identified with our solidness, because we are identified with the passing content of our minds and bodies, it is difficult without great spiritual work to come to the, not intellectual, but embodied understanding that we are living truth, that we are that light. So what we have been doing over the last few days is beginning to create a foundation of invocation, compassion, empowerment, uh, concepts that if, if you would like, you can go to my website. There is an introductory lecture, an introductory meditation, which goes into these things in greater depth than I will have time because there is new material that I would like to bring forth today. Uh, however, in the beginning, we learned to be dependent, to be grounded, to inhabit the lower part of our body, ages zero to two. Two to five, we become autonomous, independent, down in our belly center. And then around the ages of seven or eight, which we're gonna talk about today, our hearts begin to open in a more conscious way and we begin to uh, explore the possibility of conscious relationship. Now, this is all very important in talking about dying because until the heart becomes stable, until we can allow the heart to remain open, then this quality of luminosity or Christ consciousness, which is our true nature and which is here right now, will be very difficult, if not impossible, to perceive. Because with the instability of the heart-mind opening and closing, being fixated on the passing content of experience, we will be so fixated on all these things that are changing that we will not be uh, being with that which does not change. So around my neck here, I'm afraid to pull it out because of all these wires I've got on me, I have a string of beads. Each bead is different, but there is a cord. There is a cord that is stringing these beads together. Usually we identify with each individual bead. Here's a moment of happiness, here's a moment of tiredness, here's a moment of desire, here's a moment of anxiety, here's a moment of uh, on and on. What is it that does not change from moment to moment to moment? And it is very difficult, as I said before, if not impossible, to rest in that until the heart becomes stable. So what is it that does not change from moment to moment is pure awareness or consciousness. In each moment, there is nothing going on except consciousness meeting experience. And as long as we're identified with the object of consciousness or with the subject, rather than consciousness itself. The, the subject and the object that are always changing, we are 180 degrees from the truth. So the Buddhists say, if a tree falls in the forest and there is no one to hear the tree fall, which I guess includes birds and insects and all other kind of critters, but if there's no consciousness there to hear the tree falls, there is no sound. Because sound only occurs when it enters consciousness. Now, if you will indulge me, I didn't think I was going to do this, but let me recount a, a scientific experiment. Uh, some scientists, I don't remember the reference exactly, decided that they wanted to see if people actually had psychic abilities. And what they did was they got some people who seemed to have psychic abilities and they had a device that shot out subatomic particles that after a certain amount of time would decay into either subatomic particle A or B. And for the sake of the conversation, let's just assume that the chance of going to site A or B is 50%. So there were people that supposedly had some abilities and they said, can you now imagine, can you visualize that as we're doing this experiment that the particles are all going over to site A? And lo and behold, they found some people who could do that whatever that means, but that when they visualized 
in a highly statistically significant way, particles were going over to side A. So then they said experiment number two. We're going to do the experiment tomorrow. Can you visualize today that tomorrow the particles will go over to side A? And yes, once again, people could do that. Interesting, but not earth-shattering. But the interesting part, the earth-shattering part, was they said, we did the experiment yesterday. Can you visualize today that the particles are going to go over to side A? And what they found out was that if any human being had looked at the result, if the results had gone into human consciousness, all the visualizing in the world could not change it. But if the results were only in the computer and had not entered into human consciousness, then once again, visualizing could change what happened yesterday, which is maybe a funny way to use language. Uh, maybe we're not changing what happened yesterday. I don't know how you would actually language what happened. But I think that says something about the nature of consciousness being a lot more malleable and interesting that we, than we might imagine. So think about it, that something has already happened, but nobody knows what it is. We can change it by visualizing it in a certain way. And I wish Sally were here right now, because uh, one of our uh, retreat members is going to have a, a, a test when she gets done with the retreat to find out if she has pancreatic cancer. The time to visualize is before you get the results from the doctor, okay? As soon as the results goes into the doctor's mind, then you've got pancreatic cancer. Before anybody knows, even if the test is done, but nobody's looked at the test, then visualization can be much, much more effective. Okay. The test is still the test, but what I'm saying, it's the same as this experiment I just told you about. As long as the results have not gone into human consciousness, then one can visualize that the, the test has gone a certain way. Yeah. <laughs> Give it a try. Don't trust me. Okay. Just like the Buddha. Give it a try. See what happens. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today, we only have about an hour and a half here to go, a little bit more than that, is this, these, these developmental stages of going from invocation, being grounded and centered in the body, having awareness like Vipassana meditation in the mind, or having a, a, a heartfelt relationship with our yearning, to the compassion stage. Compassion is the open heart meeting suffering. Compassion is the same as loving kindness, but in the context of suffering. Compassion has some defining qualities. Compassion is, a compassionate heart is warm, it's connected, and it's spacious. And by spacious, I mean simply that the heart is not filled up with a lot of I. I'm feeling compassion. And in fact, compassion can be spelled two different ways. It can be spelled with a small c, which is I am cultivating compassion. I'm becoming more compassionate, or I'm not so compassionate today. But compassion can be also smelled, <laughs> smelled and spelled with, a, with a, a capital C, because compassion is our true nature. One of the defining qualities of the awakened mind is compassionate activity. So we are compassion. When the mind is completely open, of course, our activity will be compassionate activity. And we will respond to the suffering we see around us in a compassionate way. Now, compassion is consequently the center of the spiritual path. It's where the path changes from I am doing things, I am a practitioner, to more practices happening, that there's not somebody doing it. And that is, the qual that is the spacious quality of compassion. And I would suggest that each of you do a practice today at various times where you pick one of these three defining qualities of compassion, a spacious heart, a warm heart, 
or a connected heart and just go through maybe lunchtime today or the, some of the period after lunch or dinner time, whatever, and just be, keep asking yourself, is my heart spacious or am I getting all wrapped up in I? Or on the other hand, is my heart connected? Right now, are our hearts connected to each other? Is my heart warm? And I mentioned, uh, I don't know, Monday, I would, yesterday or the day before, the Rumi quote that grief is the garden of compassion. So one way of talking about cultivating compassion is transmuting the feeling of separation and grief into the feelings of connectedness and compassion. Grief is the negative emotional responses to feeling separate. Often sadness, but grief can be expressed as anger. Grief can be expressed as fear. Grief can be expressed in all kinds of ways. It's not just sadness when somebody leaves or somebody dies. Okay, somebody's mad at you. If you're not connected to them and you get mad back, you're having a grief reaction. Your anger is an expression of you're not being connected with that other human being. Okay, so let me read one of my favorite all-time quotes by Dear Pema Chodron. It's one of my favorite quotes because it sort of encompasses almost all of the spiritual path in one paragraph. What could be better than that, right? Okay, so uh, she uses one Tibetan term here, bodhicitta, in the sentence. Bodhicitta is the awakened heart. Just as nurturing our ability to love is a way of awakening bodhicitta, so also is nurturing our ability to feel compassion. Compassion, however, is more emotionally challenging than loving kindness because it involves the willingness to feel pain. It definitely requires the training of a warrior. When we practice generating compassion, we can expect to experience our fear of pain. Compassion practice is daring. It involves learning to relax and allow ourselves to move gently toward what scares us. The trick to doing this is to stay with emotional distress without tightening into aversion to let fear soften us rather than harden into resistance. When we began, when I began talking, the first thing I talked about was motivation. We're going to die, but we don't know when. Life is precious. There's karma. There's suffering. If our motivation is truly to be free, then when emotional distress arises, that can be the inspiration to open our heart even more rather than tighten into aversion. If you really want to be free, whenever there is contraction, whenever there is pain or suffering, that is a healing invitation that in this moment you are either pushing away or grasping something that you don't like or that you want more of. And that in that moment there is the possibility then of surrendering to the heart more and more deeply. Do you trust your heart? Or do you trust the contracted machinations of your personality structure? Well, I guess for all of us, it's both. <laughs> and there's that battle going on again and again, which is why we're here to cultivate compassion, so that eventually we can rest in the non-dual presence that is our nature. Before I plunge on, let us briefly stop and ask whether there are comments or questions. Yes, Susan. Yes.
so that there is a point on the spiritual path that when I first heard about it, I wanted to uh, throw up. Uh, and I had that reaction for quite some years. And that is, they say, that, that suffering is grace. That when something is wrong and out of balance, how wonderful, another fucking growth opportunity, as they <laughs> call it, right? And, but there does come a point when you want to be free enough, when your attraction to the truth becomes so strong, that when you feel that something is out of balance, you say, ah, here is something I can look at. Here is something that will bring me more fully into relationship, more fully into embodiment of who I actually am. Okay. So I train people to be guides for the dying. In, in a traditional society, there are people that go off into the wilderness or the desert or out into the snow or whatever to learn to be a guide for the dying. Uh, as St. Paul said, to die before you die. And unfortunately, that tradition has pretty much been lost here in the West. Uh, you're stuck with people like me. I have not gone off into the wilderness. I did go to Tibet, I did go to India, but they were short stays. <laughs> and uh, so I teach people techniques and two points. We'll talk about a couple of, of these techniques today, but there are really two levels of practice. The first level of practice is relative practice, so that I'm at the bedside of somebody who's dying. We can imagine that right here in, in the center of the room is somebody lying on the bed who is clearly approaching death. They're uh, painfully thin, their breathing is very ragged, their skin is quite yellow because their liver is failing. Uh, on and on. Now, the first thing is, do we get busy seeing a dying person? Right now, if Barack Obama walked through the door, almost everybody would see not a human being, but the President of the United States, the President of the United States, because that is such a strong identity, the President. Uh, although maybe Barack has been pulling back from that a little bit and is more of a guy than we would like him to be. But anyway, uh, when somebody is dying, it really takes practice not to get busy seeing a dying person because that dying person is pointing at you saying, you're going to die too. We are each finite human beings in some level of our, our uh, beingness that will eventually die. So to the extent we're busy seeing a cancer patient or a dying person or whatever it might happen to be, it makes it that much harder to really feel compassion. We're not connected. We're separated in the sense of connection, the compassion of connection, by our defining somebody as a dying person or as a cancer patient. So can we go beyond the, the, the definition and have a connected heart with this other human being? Uh, can we be grounded? Can we be centered? And then there is another wonderful tool called Tonglen, or taking and sending. How many of you in the room have practiced Tonglen? So that's really only maybe four or five, a handful of people. Tonglen is a, a marvelous practice. Once again, when I first heard of this practice, I didn't want to do it. Uh, the wonderful Kala Rinpoche, who was the Dalai Lama's meditation teacher, uh, was the first person who, who talked to me about Tonglen, and it took me a couple of years in order to re realize that it was not only a practice for masochists and codependent fools, but that something that could actually open my heart. Now, usually in practice, we take in the good stuff and get rid of the bad stuff. We breathe in God's love, we breathe out our suffering, we breathe out our toxicity. In Tonglen, we do the opposite. And going back to Pema Chodron's quote there, she's saying, compassion practice is daring. Compassion practice takes the training of a warrior. And Tonglen will show you exactly why that is the case. So in Tonglen practice, uh, there's a very simple way to do it. There's a more complicated way. I'm going to explain the complicated way with all of the steps 
and then when you understand that probably in practice you'll just do the main body of the practice. Tonglen is often described in doing it for another person who is suffering. But here in the West, it is often very, very important to also do it for yourself. And in fact, the way that I have been describing meditation over the last couple days, of getting grounded and centered and paying attention to what arises, uh, I like to do in the following way, that when we begin to identify these, these character patterns, places where we're stuck. I told the story that when I was very young, I got, I got an electrical shock by putting a electrical, I put, by putting a hairpin in a electrical outlet. And later on, I got another shock by putting a fork in a toaster. So I learned very early on that the world is not a safe place. And I, I meditated a lot, but the meditation didn't really get integrated into my life until I did the following thing. I began to see that in my, in my mind, there were a lot of planning thoughts where I was planning how not to get the next shock. Okay, so, and when I looked at that carefully enough, I realized that I was afraid that I would get hurt, that the world was not a safe place. So I started doing Tonglen for the place in me that didn't feel safe. And my practice dramatically shifted with just doing that one thing. But it took a great deal of humility, a great deal of flexibility to admit that this great meditation teacher that people thought I was was actually scared and that I had to take a step back and do practice for that part of myself. Okay, so we can use meditation or our life itself as a way of identifying that which is preventing us from resting in an open heart and beyond that a resting in true nature which will then allow us to die into luminosity. So Tonglen, just for ease of talking about it, we'll talk about, we're going to do Tonglen for this hypothetical dying person who is having a hard time here right in the, the center of the room. And the first thing we do is we, it's called flashing on compassion, we open our heart. One of my teachers said the way that he did that is he remembered a time in Tibet where he saw some other boys, he was a young boy, he saw other boys stoning a puppy to death. And that this, that this just ripped his heart open. Uh, when I flash on compassion, I think of when I was in India with my guru named Kroli Baba Maharaji, the guy that Ram Das was with. Uh, maybe you think of your child being born, or you think of a great uh, spiritual experience you had, or a time out in nature, but you just begin by opening your heart a bit. You prime the pump a bit. And then you begin to open to and feel in a living way the suffering of this other human being. You don't just think about it. You don't just kind of know it, but you open to what this person might be feeling. And I will say very directly here that the, the depth of the effectiveness of Tonglen is, is congruent with how willing you are to actually feel the suffering of yourself or the other person that you're working with at this point. So what is it like to be this guy who's dying? What is he feeling? Why is he suffering so much? What is his fear? Now, obviously, you won't know all the details, but you're opening your heart to what it is that he's feeling. And you feel this so deeply that compassion begins to arise in you. So first step is you flash on compassion. Second step is you feel the suffering. Third step is compassion begins to arise. You're feeling compassion for this person. You're wishing that he be free from suffering. You're wishing that he be happy. And you let this feeling of compassion deepen and deepen till you get to the point where you are willing to take his suffering into you. You feel so much compassion for him that you're willing to take the suffering into you. And then you begin the main body of the practice. And as you breathe in, you take, as in taking and sending, 
you breathe in, you take his suffering with compassion, and as you breathe out, you send the antidote with loving kindness. Now, if you're somebody who likes to visualize, which I am not, you can keep your mind busy by visualizing his suffering congealing as hot, dark smoke, and you send out the antidote as cool, white moonlight. But for me, the main practice is as I'm breathing in, I'm taking his suffering and feeling, concentrating on the feeling of compassion, and his suffering comes into every pore of my body and into my heart. And as I breathe out, I send the antidote, healing, love, with loving kindness. And I'm concentrating on the feeling of loving kindness. So I'm taking what is most difficult of his and giving what is most precious of mine. Now, this is a very radical practice, and it cuts at the root any place where you are self-clinging, self-cherishing. Self-cherishing in the West maybe has a more positive connotation, where you're clinging to a notion of separateness. It's cutting at the root because you're willing to take somebody else's suffering. You notice that in the middle of this practice, you're not transmuting the bad stuff into the good stuff. You're not fixing his suffering and changing it into love because your heart is spacious. There is room in your heart for all of the suffering in the universe, not just this guy, not just this dying person. So you don't have to transmute it. You breathe in the suffering with compassion, taking the suffering, sending the antidote with loving kindness. So this gentleman, Kala Rinpoche, he wasn't really a gentleman, Kala Rinpoche, this great lama, I was with him, and uh, one person said, I have a friend who has cancer, and I would like to do Tonglen for her, but I am afraid that if I uh, do Tonglen for her, I will get the cancer. And Kala Rinpoche said, well, if you get the cancer, you know that it worked, and he started laughing. <laughs> that was a Buddhist joke. <laughs> Because you're not breathing in the cancer, you're breathing in the suffering. You couldn't breathe in the cancer anyway. Okay. And we talked before about suffering and causes of suffering. Cancer does not cause suffering. Resistance to cancer causes suffering. Uh, I had cancer. I didn't resist it too much. It was not life-threatening cancer, which maybe made it a little bit easier. I had, I had very contained prostate cancer. But it's important to realize where the suffering arises. It arises in our relationship with experience, not in the experience itself. Okay, so you're driving down the road and you see an animal that's just died. You can do a couple of Tonglen breaths for that animal. You're walking down the street and there's a panhandler or somebody that is clearly having a really hard time. You can do a couple of Tonglen breaths for that person. Somebody in my spiritual group, a guy named Danny Goleman, that some of you have heard of, he wrote this famous book, Emotional Intelligence. He's a psychologist, so he was at one of these psychology conventions where people eat lunch about around big round tables where 12 people are eating lunch, right? You've been at one of those uh, uh, hotel conference rooms. And Danny noticed that at the table was somebody who was having a, a very difficult time emotionally. So he didn't say a word, he just sat there eating his lunch, doing Tonglen for this fellow who was having such a hard time. And at the end of lunch, another guy came up to Danny and said, I'm a psychic, and I would just like to thank you. It was so beautiful watching that love and compassion going back and forth across the table. What you did for that man was so beautiful, once again, I would like to thank you. Okay, so sometimes I'm facilitating a group. And not so much now, but when I was doing this years ago, I would tend to get a little intellectual and the room would get a little bit jagged. And I would just, without even telling anybody, I'd do some Tonglen breaths for the group. As well as doing it for an individual, you can do it for a group, uh, which we'll get to in, in a moment. And almost every time, the group would settle down. I mean, like right now, if I were to breathe in all the suffering in the room, Breathe out a blessing of loving kindness. Breathe in all the suffering. You can do that too. Breathe out loving kindness. What happens to the room? 
To me, all of a sudden, it feels softer here. I don't know if you can feel that. Maybe I'm just imagining. So the last stage in the Tonglen practice is to not just do it for this guy, but to do it for all the people who are dying right now, or all the men who are dying of that kind of cancer, or to at least expand it to some group so it's not a personal thing about this person, but it is that quality of suffering. Okay, so that's one way of doing Tonglen. Another way is you identify some part of yourself that has been suffering. Maybe something over the last days or weeks that has been causing you distress. And so then you imagine there is suffering you sitting across from meditating you. <laughs> Would you like some too? Okay, suffering you, sitting across from meditating you, and you start doing the practice for suffering you. And what you might find out, interestingly enough, is that there is resistance. Maybe you've identified that there's part of you who's anxious because you didn't get the grant. Okay, just as a random example. <laughs> and as you start doing the practice, you're having a hard time doing it. So maybe you stop doing that and you start doing the practice for the part of you that's having a hard time. That you're flexible enough that wherever the resistance is, you're beginning to feel compassion for that, being willing to take it into the meditating you and sending out the blessing of loving kindness to that part of you. Okay, we will do this together in a moment, but before we do it, are there any questions about Tonglen? On my website, there is a short description of it, and there's a very long five-page article about Tonglen by Roshi Joan Halifax that goes into great depth about this in her wonderful way of explaining things. No comments, no questions, really? Susan, and then Lisa. T-O-N-G-L-E-N. You're a psychologist. I'm sorry, you're tired at the end of the day. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. There are ways. <laughs> this is a great question. People say the work I do must be exhausting, being around dying people. And I find it very energizing and uplifting, to be honest with you. The hard part is the fundraising and dealing with the lawyers and people like that, not the, not the dealing with the dying people. Okay, so um, there's a book whose name I don't remember, which I own, and I don't remember even who wrote it, but it was written by a, a Spanish psychotherapist. And she noticed that some of her clients tended to exhaust her and some didn't. And she wanted to figure out why that she felt so drained by some and not drained by others. Others and her first her first guess was that she felt drained by the ones who had the most difficult problems, but when she looked at that, that was not the case. And when she looked a bit more carefully, she realized that the people that she connected with, she was not uh, drained by. In fact, she was fed by. And the people that she kept a sense of separation from, those were the ones that she was uh, drained by. And we talked before about the the quality of compassion, of being connected to people. So when I ran the, the, the dying center back in Santa Fe, we had a stream of people coming to die in this, this house that I was the, the director of. And uh, some of these people I really connected with immediately and some I didn't. 